Okay, everybody, good evening. <clears throat> the war to end all wars. That is the topic of tonight's discussion. Um, yeah, don't get alarmed. Obviously, um, we have to explain what this means. So, without further ado, um, we're coming up now to um, a section which, um, to a time, which really represents uh, the ultimate battle, uh, essentially, of uh, good and evil. Now, one can understand this in a number of different uh, number of different ways. One of the ways in which we can understand it is quite simply that the battle is an internal battle. The battle is an internal one that um, goes on rages inside the person. This is, in fact, a very important interpretation uh, in a general sense. It's a very important interpretation because, essentially, much of the battle that goes on in the outer world is simply a reflection of the battle that goes on in the inner world. Um, it is a basic Kabbalistic principle that a person is comprised of uh, really two parts, essentially. One part is, uh, I suppose you could call the good angel, and the other one the bad angel, or the way we like to say it is the animal soul and the godly soul. And these are constantly in uh, a state of uh, disagreement and uh, can eventually come to a state of war, a state of battle. It doesn't have to come to that if one is a wise person and uh, follows the right advice. The inner conflict uh, can be conducted in such a way that it doesn't actually um, result in casualties because essentially the animal soul really wants to do uh, what, 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 what it was created for, which is self-preservation. That's what the animal soul is all about, self-preservation. If it can be shown a better way of preserving itself, then it's quite simply um, in its best interests to follow that particular path. And in fact, that is what can be done, um, although it's not necessarily that easy to convince the animal soul that that's the way it is because the rest of the world around it is convincing the animal soul that that's, um, it's got to fight for its, um, for its place in the world and not be led around, so to speak, by the godly soul. There is actually, um, I remember seeing once a series of woodcuts, um, Chinese woodcuts, uh, very interesting uh, pictures. Uh, it was called, I think it was called the Ten Bulls, I think it was called, something like that, the Ten Bulls. And I showed a picture of a little boy and a bull. And at first, the uh, little boy is um, uh, at a distance from the bull, and they're two completely separate things. Then it shows them sort of coming closer and the bull is getting very edgy and he's getting very like uh, sort of very nervous. But uh, eventually in one of the pictures you see the boy um, um, riding astride the bull, but the bull's not going and he won't go. Then in another frame, the bull's actually moving until eventually uh, the last frame you see only the boy and not the bull, the bull's gone. Now, that depicts, I don't know what the intention of the artist was, but it sounds very much like the intention was to depict the struggle that there is between the godly soul represented by the boy and the animal soul represented by the bull. At first, they're uh, very wary of each other, but at a distance. Then they sort of come closer, and the bull is very nervous about the, and I'm sure the, uh, the little boy is nervous about the bull as well, obviously a huge you know, bull that could just flatten him in no time at all. Um, but somehow, eventually, uh, the boy actually gets to ride the bull. And he initially can't make the bull move, but eventually he does. He has a whip in his hand or something, whatever it is, or, uh, or maybe a carrot at the end of a stick kind of thing. And he encourages the bull to move, and eventually the bull disappears. In other words, the, um, the animal side of a person kind of disappears and it's no longer extant, it's no longer there. All of that is talking about um, a situation where the war is sort of an internal war until eventually that war is won. However, um, 
there is one particular war that really is not internal in the sense that it's not something that can be fought on an even playing field. It's not, it's not a war that can be fought on an even playing field. And this is where actually the, um, the verse that, we, that I sort of showed briefly earlier uh, actually comes in. Let me explain what I mean. Okay, it says over here um, in Exodus 17, 16, let me just read the Hebrew first. God says to Moses, write it in a book as a reminder in a book, and, and uh, recite it or place it in the ears of Joshua. Joshua was the one who succeeded. He was the uh, student of and then the successor of uh, Moses. That I will erase the memory of a Malik from under the heavens. In other words, I will, as I said over here, I will utterly destroy any trace of a Malik from under the heavens. And he said, this is Moses talking, and he said, For the hand of God is raised in oath by his throne, that he will wage war on Amalek from generation to generation. So you see, this is a war that we don't fight. It's a war, in a sense, it's God's war. We have to um, be involved in it. I'll explain what all this means shortly. We have to be involved in it. We can't uh, run away from it. But ultimately, it's God's war in the sense that, in the sense that I'll explain uh, shortly, in the sense I'll explain shortly. First of all, um, who was Amalek? What does Amalek represent? This this tribe. There was a certain tribe who lived in that uh, sort of in the region between um, the uh, the Sinai Desert. No, well, actually, yeah, the Sinai Desert and the land of Israel. He lived sort of towards, um, I guess you could say, towards somewhat towards um, Saudi Arabia, and um, between there and Israel somewhere. We don't know exactly where the area is now that he lived, but uh, he was very, very fierce. And he had some, it was a very fierce tribe, descended from Esau, actually. And um, they were, they had a gripe. What was their gripe? Their gripe was that why is anybody telling me what to do <laughs> that's essentially what what they what they were um uh complaining about i'll do what i want and i don't have, you know, i don't want anyone telling me what to do in other words there's no sense of accepting authority from above or from anybody else they were unwilling to accept the authority of God. They were unwilling to accept the authority of man over them. They were, so to speak, independent um, and um, had no desire whatsoever to um, make peace with heaven and earth, so to speak. So now we have a number of questions in the verse, and I'm going to explain it uh, a little bit more uh, shortly. Moses says, uh, God says to Moses, write this down as a reminder in the book and recite it in the ears of, of, of Joshua. Tell it to Joshua that because he was the one that had to fight Amalek initially. He was the one that had to fight this, um, um, this, this tribe, this nation. But we note that it says, I will utterly destroy any trace of Amalek from under the heavens. I will destroy the trace of Amalek. You have to get rid of the main part. I will destroy the traces. And it says under the heavens. We have to understand why this is. Under the heavens. And he said, For the hand of God is raised in an oath by his throne that he will wage war on Amalek from generation to generation throughout time. Now, um, 
Yeah, good point, uh, Yael. I don't really want to go into the history of Amalek so much, but that's uh, that is that is correct. Uh, that is correct. He he's a descendant of Esau and um, and wanted to um, avenge what he took as a slight by uh, Jacob, uh, whatever. Uh, let's not go into it now because um, we're going to follow the principle of um, looking at the positive side, not so much the negative, like what his reasons were and so on, but what we have to do. Okay, let's continue. There are some very interesting, um, there are some very interesting grammatical issues with this particular verse. Now, I know they don't appear in the English, but they do appear very noticeably in the Hebrew. And I'll explain what I mean. If you look at this word over here, this word case, what does the word case mean? The word case really is from the word kisui, which means to conceal or to cover over. Our sages tell us that this word is supposed to have it's supposed to have another letter there, an aleph. The word case here really means, in other words, a throne or a chair. But it's missing the letter aleph. It's missing, the, it's missing this letter here. It's missing the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And this uh, word as well, this word here is only half of the divine name. The other half of the divine name should be these letters here, the letter Vav and the letter He. It's missing these letters. So it's missing three letters, an Aleph and a Vav and a He. Now, What's the significance of um, this idea? It says the Midrash, the Midrash Tanchuma, says as follows. His name is not complete. Ein shmo shalem, ein kiso shalem, ad shmo shalom alek. God's throne is not, his name is not complete, and his throne is incomplete until the name of, or the memory of Amalek, there's various uh, versions of it, until the name of Amalek will be erased. His name, his name, God's name is not complete, and his throne is not whole, not complete, until the name of Amalek will be erased. Why? Because we see that the, 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 the words, as they are written, are missing certain letters. They're missing an Aleph, and a Vav, and a He. They're missing those letters. So therefore, the throne, the Kisei, is incomplete, and the name is incomplete because it's missing those letters. And what causes them to be missing is Amalek. Now, another question on this verse. When it says, you shall destroy the memory of Amalek, you shall erase the memory of Amalek or the, um, yeah, the, the tra any trace of Amalek as I have it here, it says, from under the heavens. Now, what does that mean, from under the heavens? What kind, of, um, what kind of message is this telling us here? Is this from under the heavens? What's, what's the meaning of that? Now, the, um, the missing letters over here, when we make up these missing letters, we make them into a word, we put them, we put them into a word, the word would be spelled as follows. That word, Iva, means to desire, a very, very strong desire very powerful desire for something. It's called a ta'ava. A ta'ava is something, a desire that constantly returns and does not rest until it is fulfilled. 
It doesn't rest until it's fulfilled. So, if we take those letters, we look around, we see a verse. There is a verse that contains this idea. Now, let me just explain what, uh, what I'm doing over here. One of the methodologies of Kabbalah in general is to attempt to find the word Kabbalah itself is actually related to the word Hakbalah, which means parallel. To make parallels between one thing and another, to find a parallel um, quality, to find a parallel quality, or to find the missing link to something in a different context. So what Kabbalah seeks to do, therefore, is to delve into um, the occurrences of something that we're looking for, but in the wrong context, in order to be able to, be able to understand much more about the original context. Let me um, give another, um, uh, basically another example of the same, uh, of the same thing. There is, um, in, in Kabbalah, we have the idea that um, the, the, the principle of evil, the principle of evil is sometimes referred to as a nachash, a nachash meaning a snake, or a saraf, a serpent, but usually a nachash, a snake. The word nachash itself Snake, obviously, this is talking about, uh, or it reminds us rather, of the primordial snake in the Garden of Eden. And of course, let's not take things too literally over there, whether it was actually a physical snake or it was just a principle of evil, which was called Nachash, whatever. Nevertheless, we understand we understand that this principle of evil caused a tremendous upheaval in the world, in the initial um, um, structure of the world, such that what went on in the Garden of Eden, which was supposed to be, it was supposed to be paradise, right? It was supposed to be um, a, a state of, uh, of spiritual bliss. And in fact, it was a state of spiritual bliss in which... Um, the world as we know it had not yet been manifested. The physical, the physical world was not manifested. The, the, the Garden of Eden, as it was, was on a higher level. According to some opinions, it was on the level of the world of Yetzirah. As we know, there are five worlds, uh, five planes of existence, five planes of reality. The highest world is called Adam Kadmon. The next one is called Atzilut. The next one down is called Bria. The next one down, uh, the fourth one is called Yetzira. And finally, we get to the spiritual counterpart of the physical world, which is not the physical world, but the spiritual underpinnings of the, of the, of the physical world, which is called the world of Asir, the world of action. That's the lowest world. Now, the world of Yetzira, higher world, the world of formation, According to some opinions, the Garden of Eden was the highest level of the highest level of um, the world of Yetzira. According to other opinions, it was even higher than that. It was in the world of Bria, a, a world which is which has not even yet been fully. It hasn't been formed yet. The world of formation is only one level down. This is a world where it's, so to speak, a world of light which has not yet been fully formed and clothed within vessels. It has its restrictions. It has its, um, 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 how shall I say them, uh, um, limitations. It has certain limitations, but nevertheless, it's a, a very spiritual world. There are even some opinions that the world there was the 
world of, that Gan Eden was in the world of Atzilut, the highest manifested world. The world of Adam Kanmon is not manifested at all. Which is a world essentially of light without vessels, the world of Atzilut. So, what happened with this whole upheaval, this principle of evil that somehow managed to overturn the spiritual dimensions of all the worlds, that um, had to later on be rectified. When did that rectification come about? So says Kabbalah, the the rectification came about much later on when when, uh, Moses was leading the Israelites through the desert and they got attacked by serpents, by snakes. They were biting people and poisoning them and so on and so forth. Moses made a snake out of brass or copper uh, and he put it up on a staff and when people looked at it, uh, it um, uh, they, were, they were cured. In other words, when they raised their eyes heavenward, they were cured. Now, the the word for for uh, snake, Nachash, and the word for what that snake that Moses made out of brass or out of copper, which is called Nechoshet, it's the same word essentially, Nachash and Nechoshet. It's the same letter as Nun Chet Shin, and Nechoshet has a taf at the end. So Nachash and Nachash were... Uh, are, are the same the same three letters, and then there's a letter added on. But those three letters, says Kabbalah, that was the tikkun, that was the rectification of what had happened before. That when Moses raised up that 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 image of a snake on a on a staff, that was the cure for it was a rectification of what had happened before. Why was it a rectification? Because what the what what the original Nachash was here, what the original snake, so to speak, did, was that it brought the world into physical um, sensation. It made a spiritual world. It brought it down to such a level that it was now um, able to be sensed, touched, so to be. It became it became um, materialized. It became materialized and grossly materialized. It became gross material being, gross material being. When Moses took some of this gross material being and he put it up on a stick and he held it up to the heavens and they looked up, that already canceled the effect. In other words, the raising up of the, of the, uh, of the banner the raising up of this uh, of this uh, snake on a on a banner on a uh, on a on the on the top of a pole, that raising up represents the idea of elevating things to a higher level, and causing the gaze of the people to ascend on high and not to be involved in sensing the world around them, but to sense a much higher order of reality. Now. Kabbalah therefore makes a parallel between these two things and shows how they are related. Similarly, in our particular case over here, when we're talking about the principle of Amalek, uh, of Amalek who was later embodied in the, uh, the evil and very wicked person called Haman or Haman, who tried to destroy Esther and Mordechai and all of the uh, Jewish people in his land. He became, he was the embodiment of that. He was the reincarnation of that. And, uh, and um, as a result, Kabbalah sees this parallel of what it was that, that Haman tried to do, that Amalek tried to do, and how the antidote comes about. Now, let me just explain what I mean here. As we said before, the letters that are missing spell the word desire. Right? And the sages say his name is not complete. In other words, the manifestation of God is not complete and he's thrown the, the, uh, the 
uh, kingdom of God is incomplete, while Amalek is around because he is the one causing, bringing about this lack or the, 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 the missing letters, he causes these letters to be missing in the throne and in the divine name. But if we can take those negative qualities, if we can take those, sorry, those missing letters, and we can turn them into a positive idea, a positive quality, then we will have changed the reality. That's what it says in Psalms. It says like this, God chose the holy land. The word Sion can mean holy land. It can also mean the innermost part of the soul. As a desire, as a place in which he desired to dwell. God chose the Holy Land because he desired a place in which to, to dwell. Desired is this word, Eva. What Amalek opposed, what he opposed was that this physical world can become a holy world. That's what he opposed. He had no opposition to the fact that there's holiness up above in the, in the upper worlds. That's why it says that I will utterly destroy the trace of Amalek from under the heavens. Because it's under the heavens that Amalek has his, has his hands on. He's trying to prevent the lower world from merging with the higher world. He's trying to prevent that oneness which will result from the merging of the two worlds from happening. In uh, Kabbalistic terminology, the Yud K on their own, that is Chochmah and Bina, and Vav K is Za and Malchut, um, and Malchut, or Tiferet and Malchut. When the name is incomplete, then spirituality only resides up above. It's not revealed down below. Similarly, when the Aleph is missing from the word Kisei, it, it simply means, when the Aleph is missing, it means concealed. The godliness is concealed. The Aleph, the Aluf Oshel Olam, the, uh, the master of the world, in other words, God, is concealed when the Aleph is missing. But if we can bring those things together and make of them one concept, one idea, one word, essentially, one word, essentially, then that becomes a unified uh, ex it becomes a unified existence, which is the whole purpose of creation. The whole purpose of creation is not that a member of the creation, someone who's living within the creation, will leave the creation, so to speak, and ascend on high. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to bring God down to earth, so to speak. In other words, to bring heavens, bring the heavens down to earth, not the earth up to the heavens. Bring the, the divine presence into this world. Now, what does that mean in terms of uh, in terms of the inner struggle in which we uh, in which we find ourselves? We started off talking about the inner struggle, and then we went to the uh, onto the bigger picture, the outer struggle. In other words, the struggle to make the world a holy place. Well, exactly the same that exists in the macrocosm exists as well in the individual in the microcosm. If a person's um, aspiration is to merge into holiness by sort of divorcing himself from the world around him and merging into a higher consciousness, that drive, although it's not a negative thing, it's not a bad thing, it's ultimately incomplete. God does not want more angels, so to speak. <laughs> he wants human beings to be, um, he wants human beings in this living in this world to be godly. That's, what, that's what's desired from us. Now, when we say he wants human beings to be godly, it doesn't mean that we should be walking around, uh, you know, like uh, with our feet uh, six inches off the ground and, 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 and being practical. No, we have to be very practical and it demands practical action. In other words, what we have to do is we have to sanctify, essentially sanctify the vessels. Sanctify 
the life and the world and the, the, the and the things that we come into contact with and things that we do on a daily basis on an everyday basis and that is the ultimate um, fulfillment of the desire of uh, of the Almighty and then Amalek will have disappeared it'll have been wiped out we can't go the entire way ourselves but what we have to do is we have to fight as much as we can we have to preserve in our own lives that inner holiness that is innate within us and bring it into everything that we do in order for the blessing to uh, to sort of dwell upon us um so Terry asked an interesting question. Is Moses saying that desire is a wonderful servant yet a hideous master? That's a very interesting expression. Um, I haven't thought about that, but it sounds, uh, it sounds very interesting. It sounds that like uh, it may well be correct. Um, it is a servant when we use it in the right way. It's a master if it uses us in the, in the, in the way it wants to use us. Yes, I would, I would imagine that that's correct. So Alan says as follows, Yosef over a Khoshek, Shalosani, Hashem Os Eleya. I am he who makes them right. I make peace and create evil. Do all these things. Does this refer to a process from uh, form versus create, make versus create? Seems like it applies to how it happened. And can it be applied to the lesson tonight? I'm not sure that I actually get the question. Uh, Alan, if you could perhaps uh, ask me again privately and, um, you know, just send me an email and I'll, I'll try and figure it out uh, a little bit more. It could be. Uh, are there any questions, by the way?